thank you, Chair. Um, Secretary, let's go back to my comment on career pathways. I think it's really important that people, certainly in high school, uh, begin to get a sense of what jobs are out there, what the job satisfaction of those jobs is like, what, what the comparative salary level of those jobs is compared to other jobs. And let's be sure people have choices um, in that career pathways uh, account, we started that in, um, put it in FY 2020. This, uh, in the most recent bill, we provided $15 million, which was an increase of $5 million. Your department uh, last June gave the first awards under this program were made through the, the uh, 2020 funding. Um, as you start making decisions, what, what are you going to do about this program and how are you going to monitor the success of the awards you've already given? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, Senator, you know, I, I certainly agree with you in, in, in career pathways being an important aspect to make sure we continue to fund in this budget. Uh, because many young people in America, as was said in actually both of your opening statements, not everyone's on a pathway to a college. And we have to make sure we're creating pathways into different careers. Uh, we did, this, this, this program uh, was not dropped out of the budget. Uh, we didn't specifically call it out in the 2023 budget. We actually requested an increase of $226 million for the National Dislocated Reserve, which funds these grants. So it's part of the National Dislocated Funds, which, which funds these grants. And, and one other thing to be more clear, clarifying this, I will absolutely work with you in your office afterwards to make sure that this is very clear, that you want, we understand that these pathways monies are still in the budget we actually look for an increase well let's do that because your your staff told us uh, just a couple of days ago you specifically didn't request money in this category so let's talk about not today but let's follow up and talk about what we intend to do there how we're going to monitor the grants that are already out there and i think what the chair and i have tried to focus on in the committee has been uh, being sure people have the information they need and then the opportunities they need to pursue as quickly as they can the jobs they'd like to have rather than spending years after high school uh, searching for the information that they could have gotten while they were in high school or just after they got out of high school. And so we're going to continue to talk about that. On apprenticeships generally, how do we ensure that all of the industries that want to participate in, in the registered apprenticeship program have a chance to do that. Yeah, we're reaching out right now. We're sitting down with stakeholders. We're talking to industry about creating those pathways. I honestly feel in my heart that um, we're living in a unique moment in time. We're seeing people quit their jobs at high rates. We're seeing companies having a hard time finding people to go work for them. We're seeing young people that, that just can't connect to a good paying job. And I think the best way, in my opinion, is looking at apprenticeships in different industries, in the healthcare sector, in the IT sector. You see it in the building trades and you see it in the trucking now, how it's working. We take that model that's working in those industries. I also want to add a component of pre-apprenticeship. So young people have the opportunity. I, I, was over in, I was over in Germany a couple weeks ago, I was at Volkswagen. And I met with um, the leadership of the Volkswagen company, and I, I saw the technology in there. But I, I met with about 20 young people between the ages of 16 and 18 years old that were apprenticeship. They were in apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship at Volkswagen. And they were getting a stipend, but they were also learning on-the-job training, not, not necessarily how to use the machinery, but they were getting a skills in coding and how to use technology. And, and I asked them, I said, you know, they go to school a couple days a week and they're in, in the company a couple days a week. We need to start thinking of those models that we're seeing in Europe that have been so successful in apprenticeship good. in Switzerland. So we are working on those. Okay, good. On uh, H-2B visas, the part-time <coughs> workers, this is a big uh, issue in, uh, in a lot of sectors of our economy, particularly the, uh, the tourist sector. And if you don't have those part-time workers, the full-time jobs go away. We need to be sure that people understand that, that there are seasonal jobs where if you don't have the seasonal workers ready to come in and take the seasonal jobs, uh, then the jobs for other people that are full-time, year-round jobs uh, go away because the, the whole process just doesn't work. That's particularly evident uh, in tourism. 
um, in, in the um, last edition of workers, and, and I think the department uh, has expanded the program in a significant way, about 121,000 uh, H-2B visas, but the last 30, 5,000 of those were gone within five business days. Once you said we're gonna have 35,000 new opportunities, they were gone within five days. How are we monitoring that? And would you help me express the importance of being sure those kinds of jobs are filled for people who work alongside part-time workers and have full-time jobs they wouldn't have if those part-time workers weren't there? Yeah, let me, um, first and foremost, um, we the, the the I had a meeting with my office last week to talk about the H two B program about the uh, distribution of the visas because some of the senators here at this table and, and other members of the Congress and Senate have called me both Democrats and Republicans about it and the the increase in interest in this program in the thousands of companies that are, are now applying for these grant these visas have exceeded, we've never seen as much business or as much interest in this program. Um, so we're having conversations. I think what we need to do with the H-2B visa program, and we're doing some internal conversations, I think we have, need to have a real honest conversation about what the future of the program should look like. We expanded this year in the first round of H-2B visas, I want to say 22,000 visas. Mm -hmm. In the second round, we added another 35,000. That's the largest allotment additionally of H-2B visas since uh, the program was revamped in 2013. Um, and and the, the need or, or the, the desire to be getting these programs are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's happening is a lot of companies that are, that are filling out applications for these programs, they're, fill, they're doing it wrong because they've never done it before and they get disqualified. So all of the people that know what they're doing are getting their applications in and they get these grants. That's one problem. The second problem is, and we had this conversation, as I said the other day, we talked about the different industries in America. You have sugar down the south. You have the crabbing industry on the coast. You have the fishing industry in Alaska. We're thinking about how do we make sure when we create these extra allotments, is there a way for us to be able to put some allotments aside? Because if it comes out in April, then, then the farmers might get all the H-2B visas, but you need something in, in, in September or October for a different harvest or something like that. So we're looking at the program right now uh, on, on how, do, how do we make this program, I wouldn't say more efficient, uh, more successful. This program is needed. I'm a supporter of the program, quite honestly, uh, because in, in a lot of areas that, that, that it's really difficult to get workers in, in a short period of time. These companies, were at, we asked these companies to, two things. One is to make sure there's strong labor protections for the workers that come from, 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 from um, the southern border, number one, and, and Haiti and some other places. And number two, we want to make sure that they do do their due diligence in trying to hire local American workers prior to them getting H-2B visas. So we're asking them those two things. Like, you make sure you do make an honest effort to look for, for workers, number one. And number two, we ask them as well to make sure they treat their workers fairly. Good. I'd be more than happy to work with you and your staff on this. It's a problem. It's a, it's, it's a problem we've dealt with for a long time. I think the numbers you've put out there this year are as aggressive on this program as anybody's ever been, but the work environment is different than any environment we've ever been in, and that's why it makes some sense, but I'd love to work with you on it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Schatz.